Okay, so we have uh, the Fourier coefficient of, uh, of the restricted function. Um, so it's interesting to see in quality the, um, the weight on this Fourier coefficient expectedly over Z. Um, so we have a reminder right here, uh, up here, um, what is exactly the Fourier uh, transform of this Fourier coefficient as a function of Z. Uh, so we can use it uh, to, to, this, to do this calculation. And then we have uh, the Perceval that let us uh, take just the, the rate of the function f uh, that lies on the characters that their alive variables are exactly uh, t. Okay, so in this is simple and another uh, interesting uh, random variable, which we can think what is its value, is a weight on level k of the restricted functions. As we said, we want the rate to be on level one. So what is level k weight? This is just the Fourier coefficient, the weight of the Fourier coefficients on characters of size k. Um, so we can, we can, uh, just calculate it, it's very easy to calculate. We just take all the characters of size k of the restricted function and take what we calculated before uh, and all the summations together. Um, it's exactly the rate of the Fourier, uh, of the Fourier, present, uh, Fourier transform of f, the Fourier spectrum of f, uh, of, on characters that have exactly k alive variables. So it actually actually depends only on J. Um, so let's take it uh, level up the randomization and random also J. What happened if we take J and randomize it? Um, so how can we random J? Just choose every variable to stay alive with some probability, let's say mu. And now we again, uh, we get the set of variables of the alive variables, it's uh, J, it's random. We don't know uh, what variables are going to stay alive. And we also uh, choose random uh, Z, the assignment for the, uh, for the other characters. Uh, we again get a random function that now it, it's double random. We get both J and Z is random, which means that even the, the variables that it works on, even the number of variables is a random, uh, is a random variable that depends on J and Z. So we can think about uh, interesting random variables to calculate. So for example, uh, let's, see, let's think about how many uh, variables uh, it, the function, the restricted function depends on, which is the size of J, it's easy to calculate. We have N variables, each one uh, chosen, chose with the probability mu. So we have mu fraction of the variables. Uh, even more, we can look at any character in F and uh, think whether it's stay alive or not, uh, or how many variables in it stay alive. So for example, we can think about uh, any character and what is expected uh, size of S uh, intersecting J. Uh, this is how many alive variables uh, left from S. This is again will be exactly a mu fraction of the variables in S. Um, so what we have here is that large, characters with appropriate random restriction might be much smaller. If we want a character to, to get uh, to the first Fourier level, um, we have to choose mu uh, in appropriate way. For example, if S is of size D, we take mu to be one over D and then we'll expect the only one variable from S to stay alive. And uh, the weight we have on, on S in the function F 
will go uh, all the way down to the first level. So, oh, oh my god, okay. Um, random, uh, okay, so what we have here. Um, so let's calculate again the, the level K weight for some K. And uh, now for both J and Z are uh, random. So we can use what we calculated before, the, the level K weight for random Z, once we know J, and, and then we get uh, that it is, it's actually the, uh, the rate of the characters that are weighted with the probability of them to, to, to end up in the level K. Every character uh, contribute its uh, uh, weight to level K with probability that it will have exactly K alive variables. Um, let's see an example. If we think about homogeneous function of degree exactly D, um, so we can choose uh, every variable to stay alive with probability one over D and then we get that every character has constant probability to, uh, to end up on the first Fourier level. This way, we will have that the expected uh, rate on the first Fourier level for the restrictions of this function, uh, the appropriate restriction is one over the probability to stay alive, uh, is constant. We can take this, uh, uh, this example and relax it a little. We don't need, in, in order to have a constant rate on the first Fourier level, expectedly with uh, mu one over D, we don't need the function to be exactly of degree D. We can think about functions that are uh, approximate degree D in some sense. Uh, so let's think about another example if f uh, is close to homogeneous function of degree d, what do I mean that I say close to homogeneous function of degree d? If it has constant uh, weight on degree exactly d, we still ha will have a constant rate on, on the first Fourier level of the restrictions expectedly. Okay, because all the uh, the rate of degree D, constant part of it, constant fraction of it is going down to the first Fourier level. So it's enough that we have their constant and to relax the notion of a homogeneous of degree exactly D. Um, and here we can see the difference between uh, using the log Sobolev and the hypercontractive. To use the hypercontractive, we need exactly degree D. Here in this uh, example, we, may, we might have uh, some weight even in degree n, but it's enough that we have constant rate on degree d. Let's see another example. Um, let's think about another notion of uh, approximate degree d. We don't only need the, uh, the constant rate to be exactly on degree d, it's enough that it's, uh, the, the constant rate is on levels around D, that the uh, characters that are of size approximately D, constant times D, uh, all of them together uh, have constant rate. And then for every character of this uh, of size approximately D, we have constant probability uh, that only, that exactly one variable will stay alive, will be in J. Um, so why, why it's interesting to think about uh, functions of approximate degree D. So first of all, we know how to do random restriction to, uh, to, take, their, uh, to take them to the first Fourier level. And then we know what to do with functions with a uh, so small degree. And it, it's common to, uh, it's interesting because we can do uh, with every function, we, we can find some D where it has uh, enough degree. So 
um, you can you can think about any function, and then with the dyadic uh, partition, we can you can part it to uh, to look at the zero to n half and n half to n, and see where do you have uh, more uh, weight, and then do something like a binary search to find the right d that you have enough rate. So we're not expected for every function to be constant, but not so small. We might find some d that we have one over log n fraction of the weight uh, on um, around d on levels uh, that are approximately d. Um, we we may assume for for now we will assume that we have exactly d exactly uh, that we have some d that we have constant uh, constant went there, but uh, but you can see that that even one over log n is not so small and might be enough in some cases, uh, so it's reasonable to think about functions uh, like this. Okay. So just a reminder, what is the degree D function, the approximately D? We, this is a function that appro on approximate D, we have uh, enough weight, uh, which I mean constant rate. So this is the first assumption that I'm doing uh, uh, to cheat. Um, I take the function that we want, uh, I just remind you that I wa we want to, to prove the KKL theorem and uh, we find some D where around D we have uh, the maximal weight, the D that maximizes the weight. And now we assume that it's constant instead of uh, one over log n. So let's do the random restriction with the mu equal one over D. We want all the, the, the weight from degree around D to drop to level one. Um, so as we calculated, we have now for uh, for random J and Z uh, um, constant rate on on first four eleven, and that means that there is some J uh, that maximizes this uh, um, this weight, and we can fix from now on. We can fix this J and work with uh, random Z. We just know now that there is some J that have this. And now uh, let's think what we have. If, if we can say that for every Z, there is, uh, we, can, we can find Z that, uh, that, have, that are very close to dictatorships, for example. And if we think about it, uh, if it will be the case that all the restrictions uh, or enough restrictions, many restrictions will have the structure of, uh, of dictatorship and they, have, they will have the same dictatorship, it means that actually this dictatorship, uh, this variable that all of them chose uh, is actually very influential for every subcube that there is that, that, that determined uh, um, some j to be the dictatorship, it's very influential in this subcube. If, and, and if we have uh, many subcubes that same variable is the dictatorship there, this variable has a large influence. So we can think of, of it that uh, um, that's what we need in, uh, in the KKL theorem to say that there is a variable that is very influential. Um, so it, it's enough to find enough z that uh, that have same variable as their di dictatorship, and otherwise, if all of them are small, we have to find the total influence large from somewhere else. We really have to find uh, influential edges somewhere in the in the cube that is not in this uh, uh, dictatorships. So let's uh, cheat again and assume that for every z, we have exactly uh, um, one on the first Fourier level. All the rate is there. And 
for sure it's a very simplified assumption, um, but let's go with it. And therefore, once we have all the rate on the first Fourier level, we can actually think about it that every Z is actually uh, determine some XJ to be its dictatorship. So let's go with it. And I hope we'll have some time to get rid of this assumption. Uh, but let's think about it. Um, so for now, uh, we can think about every Z and J uh, as a, some association, some mapping from Z to J. And let's partition the cube uh, as um, in the way that every Z, all the Zs that choose the same variable to be their dictatorship. So let's put all of them together uh, in a group. We'll call this group AJ, AK, AL as which dictatorship they chose. So all the, the restriction that chose some XJ um, are together. And now we can think where are the, the influ what is the influential edges uh, around in the, in the cube? So either um, the influential edges are inside the, the, this partition, if there is a group which is large, all of this, uh, um, all the Zs that in, in some uh, group uh, have the same, uh, the same dictatorship, and this is an influential bit for all of these inputs. So if it's large, we have uh, the um, large influence. You can see that also every Z, we have exactly equality here. The density of AJ is exactly the influence of the variable J. Of course, inside AJ, uh, XJ is influential because this is the dictatorship and outside AJ, uh, we have another dictatorship. So XJ is not influential. So this is exactly the probability of, uh, of Z to be in AJ. It's ex exactly the probability of J to be influential. And this just uh, again, a reminder, if it's small, we are done. If it's large, we are done. We have large influence. So let's assume that all of this, um, subsets, all of these, uh, the partitions of AJ, all of them are small. And now we, we are left of, uh, we have to, to show that there are many influential edges somewhere else. So what we are left with, um, it's only the edges between, in between the, uh, the sets. And uh, let's note that every edge between a some aj to other a to another uh, set of z is influential edge, almost every edge. Uh, it's going from one dictatorship to another dictatorship. So, if the values of xj and xl are different, then we have influential edge, which means that half of the edges in between the uh, between the the subsets between the partition are influential. So in this case, we only have to show that we have many influential edges, uh, or actually that we have many edges between those uh, subsets of the cube, sub, subsets, yes, subsets of the cubes. Um, okay, so we actually done, we just have to show that we have a lot of, uh, of edges there. So let's see how we have a lot of edges there. It's pretty easy. Uh, so we are going to use the log Sobolev inequality. Um, what is the log Sobolev inequality? So we have some definition and I, uh, I want to talk about it now. And we have the theorem and we have a corollary and I will go uh, straight to the corollary and we'll go back to the log Sobolev after that. So from the log sobel of inequality, we can uh, divide the edge, the standard as edges of parametric inequality, um, which we know even without the log sobel of inequality. So we can take it uh, for our use. 
uh, what it means that for every subset of uh, of the of the cube, which is small, uh, the edge boundary of this set uh, is large. What we have here, the edge boundary of the set A is at least the number of uh, of vertices in A log one over the density of A. So if the density of A has we, uh, we assume is smaller than one over square root n, we have here that uh, the number of edges in the boundary is log n times the vertices in, uh, in A. And what we actually have is for every subset, we have this amount of, uh, of edges um, going from inside AK to outside. So let's sum up all the edges uh, together. So again, we count every edge twice, once from uh, the side of, uh, of AK and once, and the other eyes from the other uh, uh, vertex and oops. Um, and summing all, up all of them, we get, it's cover all the, the hypercube. So we actually get two to the N times log N sensitive edges which uh, if we normalize it, we get exactly the average sensitivity is larger than log n, which exactly what we wanted to, to get. So what actually the KKL theorem uh, said is that once you do this process, either you have some uh, dominant uh, dictatorship or otherwise, you have uh, a lot of influential edges in between the, uh, the restrictions. So that um, I, what we have done. Yeah. I guess the example that you gave earlier with the address function uh, really falls in the second case, right? So like after you fix the address bits and all the, you know, every dictator appears with probability only one over two to the K which is kind of small, it's like one over n, but the address bits are influential, so. Yes, sure, exactly. Ad address bits are very, very influential. And for every change you do, you just get another dictatorship. Yeah. Um, so I just wonder whether to, to go back to the log Sobolev now. Yeah, okay, I'll do that. Um, so, so far it seems that you don't rely on log Sobolev. I mean, you just rely on the edge as a yeah. parametric inequality. Yes, you're right. Um, so why we need the, the log Sobolev? Uh, we did a very strong assumptions here. Uh, we, we actually um, assumed that, I'll go back to the assumption there. Um, Actually, assume that for every z we have exactly one there, and uh, um, and it is exactly a dictatorship, which is far from being true. <laughs> um, okay, now it's stuck there in my uh, clicks. Um, I wait a little. So. Okay, let's continue to go back. Um, opa, okay. Um, so we are here. Okay, so we want to get rid of this assumption uh, that for, there are actually two assumptions that we want to get rid of them. One of them is that uh, we have constant rate on the degree uh, approximate D when we know that we actually have one over log N there is some d that we have one over log n. And the other one is here that we assume that for every z we have exactly uh, one. What we actually will do, uh, that are two separate uh, solutions um, for the assumption that the degree is, uh, uh, that we have one, exactly uh, weight one for every z. What we will do, we, uh, we, we will use the expected uh, argument we uh, will use another function. I will show it uh, uh, in a minute. 
and 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 we'll use the expected argument over all uh, the functions in order to uh, to get large influence. And the the function that we are going to use is um, is going to replace the function which is the indicator of uh, of the sets uh, a j. We we are not going actually to have. Uh, um, perfect uh, sets that every Z have exactly uh, one variable that, uh, that it's uh, true as a dictatorship. We really have used uh, uh, having the, uh, the constant rate on the first Fourier level uh, in a sense that, uh, that there, there is some, uh, for a lot of Z, there is some uh, Fourier coefficient in the first Fourier level, which is uh, large, which is close to one. And we, we will expect on them. Uh, the, this is one solution that I'm going to talk about it. And the other, the, the other problem, which we assume that, uh, that we have constant rate on, uh, uh, on, on the degree D, on the approximate degree D, uh, for that, we will have another solution. I guess I will not have time to, to go into, uh, for it. But uh, what we do is actually to, um, to separate the, the characters of F uh, to chunks from every uh, K between, uh, uh, for, for every D, which is uh, power of two, will take the part of function around D and uh, the combination of all these functions is function F will define on those functions the, uh, the total influence, for example, and the summation of all of them will be the total influence of F and we'll analyze every chunk uh, uh, separately. Um, and and then combine all of them together. And this is how, the place when we really need the, the log sobel of inequality because we want to combine uh, chunks of the, of the function together. And then we need the additivity, additivity of, the, of the expected degree. So um, what we'll do now, we, uh, we'll solve the, the first problem. Uh, that we assumed here, all of them are the same. So I have another uh, presentation for it. Um, I'll just find it. Okay, um, it's not what you ha you need to see, but one minute. Um, Okay, so I will talk about uh, about uh, about the log sobel a little bit, and uh, and then we'll see how to use it in order to solve our problem. So what we have, what is exactly the log sobel um, We have the definition uh, of the entropy uh, of the f squared. Um, now I'll try to do it alive. So we have the entropy of F squared and, and it's defined as uh, something that looks like the entropy. Actually, I don't really understand why they, it's called entropy because it's, uh, this is the information left in the random variable F squared X. Uh, it's actually N minus the entropy of the F squared X, um, the Shannon entropy that we, that is well known, um, up to some normalization. And, and what Log Sobolev said is that this entropy, which is the information left in the, in the variable F squared is smaller than it's bound the, the total influence from, uh, uh, from bound the total influence. And we worked, 
actually part of the work is uh, was to to analyze this entropy of f, the part which is the entropy of f, um, in order to get a simpler corollary which uh, we actually use, um, which we have is. Uh, um, Instead of using the entropy, which is a little bit harder to, to use as an expected function, um, we replace it with, uh, with norms, norm two and norm one of f. Uh, norm one is a little bit weird here, but uh, that's how it appears in the log sobolab. And for, for, for Boolean valued functions, it's not really different because all the uh, norm one is exactly norm two squared. So the square of norm one is exactly the, the squared norm two. So it will be okay. Um, how did you prove this corollary? So it's very simple. We just need, uh, in order to prove this corollary, we just need to, um, to bound the entropy with the uh, with the norms, and the way we did it, we just used the the Cauchy Schwarz in order to simplify uh, the uh, the expectation, and and an easy fact that say that for every t, it's actually a calculated fact, and that of, for every uh, value here inside the, the log function. So when we have the squared here, it's less than uh, the, the absolute value. And that's how we get the, uh, the first norm of f. Um, so what is the meaning of this, uh, of the log Sobolev? Um, so maybe I will uh, do it later. Uh, there is something interesting about it as uh, and the um, uncertainty principle. It's uh, pretty related, but let's just use it for our needs. So what we have here, um, we just wanted to, uh, to simplify, uh, to get rid of this assumption. Um, so what we do now is, uh, Let's analyze what happened here when we with our assumption. So we have the restricted function, which did, which Z chooses the uh, the indicator x j. How it choose it? It uh, actually chose this uh, indicator. Um, in its Fourier, so once it, it's the indicator, we know exactly how the Fourier transform uh, work. The the Fourier coefficient of the singleton j is exactly one. And uh, and for all the other uh, characters, we have Fourier coefficient exactly zero. So it's very, very simple uh, uh, structure. So now let's define uh, the function for every j, the function gj, that actually take this uh, uh, Fourier coefficient as a, a function. So it's go to zero, one. Um, it's actually say which one is uh, which one of the uh, of the variables z determined as its uh, um, dictatorship, but you can see that now it's much more flexible because we can use uh, the definition of j g j. You see that this is exactly the function uh, which was the. Um, the indicator function of the subset um, that that determined a j, um, uh, but now we know that even if it's not exactly one, and we don't have exactly the uh, the x j, so the function g j is now going to r. We still can use this function as the function that said uh, for each z how much it close to be a uh, dictatorship of uh, J. And, and now we can see that 
actually once the 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 four year level on the first the the four year weight on the first four year level is actually consist of these functions of the gj functions the um for some z the summation of all uh these functions i'll do it actually if we fix some g some z the four year weight uh, on the level one for this z um, is actually the summation of all this function uh, j, g, j of z squared. Okay, so we, we see that now we have a very strong connection between those functions that are not already uh, Boolean. Uh, with the, the first four year level of the restriction. Um, so what we had here was the AJ, and now we are going to replace it with the GJZ, which acted in the simplified assumption as the indicator, but now we'll take it without uh, uh, being the indicator, but close to this. And again, we want to say that uh, somehow mu aj, that here is the uh, second norm of j, uh, we somehow want to say that it's still uh, small or large as we, as we need. So let's prove something about it. Um, Okay, so we'll use the function gj instead of the indicator. Okay, we we'll get rid of it. And let's see what we have. So this is not alive, you see. And uh, okay, so we have here the definition of uh, gj. And let's say, um, okay, so as, as we, we have already uh, did, uh, we have the we have some j uh, capital j that is fixed. That for this this j uh, the weight on the first four year level expectedly over z is at least constant. Now uh, we'll see a very trivial uh, um, a lemma. Let's say that actually the expected uh, the summation over all uh, J's, the second norm of GJ is also uh, at least con constant. And how it works, it's just because the, uh, um, the equality that we have, that GJ is exactly the singletons. Okay, so now um, we want to show uh, that every GJ, uh, no squared norm is less than the j's influence. So if uh, if there is some uh, so with the way we we'll use it that if there is some influence j which is large again we are done and otherwise all of them are small smaller than say uh, one over square root n and then we. Um, and, and then we, we will need to find the total influence in other place, which will be very similar to the edges that we have found uh, before. So how do we prove this, uh, uh, this lemma? It's actually very similar to, uh, to what we've seen before that was the exact case, uh, but, but a little bit refined. So let's think about uh, GJ, um, as its definition as the Fourier coefficient. And then, uh, and then we have, uh, we have it uh, as the, its projection of uh, FJZ on the, on YJ, on the variable YJ. This is actually the inner product as a definition of the Fourier coefficient as we have here. Um, which we can separate for the cases when yj is one and, my, and minus one. And we get that this is exactly the uh, difference between the value of f when 1j, yj is one and yj is minus one. 
uh, over two. It, this is very similar to the influence. It, it's actually the, uh, the value of the derivative function. This is, maybe I need to change the color. Um, something. Okay, so this is actually the, uh, the derivative J of F at the point Z, Y. Okay, so if we, we analyze now the L2 squared of JG, um, so it's just uh, expectation over Z of the values of JG uh, Z, which is exactly uh, this uh, expectation, which is actually the derivative of J. And y squared. Um, and now using Cauchy Schwartz, we take the square inside the expectation and we get exactly the influence J of F. Okay, so now we have, we can go uh, along the way with this G, GJs, the, the singletons coefficients uh, that are small expectedly for every J. Um, and now we need to find the total, the large total influence. So how can we find it? As again, as we did uh, before, we try to find it as uh, the edges between uh, the functions. So we'll do it again, like more, just more refined. Um, so let's see uh, another lemma. I um, need to change my color again. So the, let's take all the GJs and see that the total influence is larger than the, the summation of all of their total influences. Uh, hint, we will uh, use the log Sobolev in order to, uh, to bound the total influence of, influences of GJ. And then we'll sum up all of them together and to get uh, bound for the total influence of F. Um, so again, this is exactly what we did uh, before, just GJ was the indicator of AJ. Okay, so how can we see that? Um, so the total influence of F is larger than the influences, the individual on influences of, on, that are not in J, in J that is the influences of the variables that are not alive, the variables that are in there under restriction, um, which are each one of them, here we use the lemma, uh, each one of them is larger than uh, the influences. Actually, it's uh, may, maybe it is equality here. Um, the, all the influences of I over GJ. No, I'm not sure it's equality. It somehow uh, takes the, um, uh, all the influences over uh, all the directions and uh, sum up over them together. Uh, it's not equality just because of uh, some norms that are norm one, norm two, and things like this. Um, but technic te technically, it's close to be equality. And, and what can, is- Can I ask you to go back to the previous slide? I forgot what was we can Yes, ask. sure. Here yeah. or- No, no, the, the one with the lemma, I guess. So we had this lemma that said, we, we think, okay, the, 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 uh, the idea here to, uh, to think about GJ as a function that said uh, for every Z, to uh, whether it's close to be dictator or J or not. So it, it's not, it's not the, the, the case, but it's easier to think about it like this. And then for every J, uh, expectedly over Z, we have uh, uh, at most the, the influence of J. Okay, and now all we involve with are the GJs 
that are actually the uh, oh, what I did um, that actually there are the uh, the singletons coefficients and uh, uh, and either we have one of them which is large or otherwise we have uh, their their total influences together are uh, large. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, so let's go like there. Um, okay, so here we have a, a, a lower bound for the total influence. And only what we, we left with is just to lower bound uh, this part. Once we lower bound this part, uh, we are done. We just need to say this is louder than log n, and that's enough. So um, let's see how we do it. I think that uh, let's be part this slide. Um, okay, so we will go back here uh, to, to our corollary of the log sobolev. And we apply, we'll apply it. Uh, we'll apply this for every g j. So we have uh, the total influence of f is larger than uh, summation over j uh, in j. And this uh, this amount for every g j. So this is f uh, g j. L to squared norm log one over gj L to squared norm minus four gj L to squared and gj uh, first norm to the half. Um, okay, so the summation is, is, is in the beginning. I will put it here instead of using the, uh, the constant. I like to omit constants. J, 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 N, J. Um, so now what we know about uh, this maybe complicated thing. Um, so the first thing we know that we want it to be large. And, and this is because we assumed something is small. So what we know this is small, uh, just a remainder here, uh, G, J, L to square norm was smaller than the influence J, which we assumed smaller than one over square root N. So we can see that we have here, let me change the color. Uh, we have here a nice bound. Okay, we have the GJ L to squared, which we know that is small. So here is our log N. We can put it, um, okay, I'll just replace it with log N. I hope you're okay with it. And another thing we have, this summation. We already talked about this summation. This is, it's actually count all the uh, Fourier rate on the first Fourier level. So all of them together are the uh, variance of F or actually the, uh, the weight on the level D of F. Um, I'll put here, uh, I'll put here the rate of level D of F because it's more uh, accurate. Level around D of F. But let's think about it as constant. And what we, wa we now want to see that uh, the other semand here doesn't cancel it. So it's enough to show that it is small. If it's small enough, we are done. Yep. So that's, that's what we are going to see. The disamand is uh, small, and that's how we use the log sobolev inequality in order to, um, to combine uh, functions uh, together, all the GJs together, the influ their influences, um, and get the, the influence, actually the expected degree of them with the expected degree of F. Okay, this is uh, uh, the power of log sobolev, it's here. This is the point. 
Um, so let's just um, for uh, for things to be complete to, for completeness, uh, show that this is uh, small. So I will do it here. I hope I have enough space. Um, so we have the summation over J. Um, and this is, I just, uh, I'm going to use uh, um, cauchy schwarz inequality in order to separate them uh, from the summation, separate both the, uh, the second norm and the first norm. So it's smaller than the summation over G, J, L to squared and summation over G, J, L1. J and J. Okay, so what we already know from here is that the first um, multiplicative there is uh, small. This is the same what we had here. So we have here the uh, square root of uh, level D uh, Fourier, trans Fourier weight of F. And here we can think about it as um, the, okay, in the same way that we have, we have seen that the L2 squared norm of JG is smaller than the influence, uh, we can show exactly same proof that the first norm of JG is less than the first norm. Um, so let's do less than the first norm of, uh, of the derivative function on the J, J direction um, L1 norm. Okay, it's exactly the same proof. And for, we assume that F, F is, is Boolean. So L1 norm of the derivative function of F is exactly as the influence of F, of the, I, of the J's influence of F as, as the L2 squared norm. So we can put here actually the total influence. So we have here the total influence of F. And now it's, uh, it's clear that uh, this term is much smaller than uh, say the total influence that we have in the other side. This is the square root of it. Uh, so we can just uh, omit it. And actually we are done. Um, we, had the, we have the, uh, the total influence, which is large. Um, okay, so in purpose, I left here the around D. Um, so what we do now is just to separate uh, the function F to chunks dyadic, as the dyadic uh, partition. And for every chunk, we do this the same and sum, sum all up all of them together. So it's not exactly what I said because the main problem here is that the chunks uh, are going to be not uh, Boolean and even uh, maybe not uh, um, uh, rounded values, um, but we we go over we go on this uh, these problems. Um, it's not so hard, but I will not go into it now. Um, so, any questions about the proof before I'm going uh, some summary? So maybe you can mention where did you use the, the booleanity? What mention? Where did you use booleanity? Um, so the, the last step that I used booleanity was uh, here to, to go from uh, first for, from the, the norms one of the influences of the derivative functions to uh, Cannot start your video. Okay. 
you will not uh, have to see me. Um, okay, so uh, this is a place and actually it's crucial uh, uh, because what we actually did, uh, we proved the KKL theorem for uh, bounded functions and not, for, uh, not only for uh, uh, Boolean functions. And then uh, another thing that we did on the, on the KKL is, um, is that, that we prove it actually, uh, um, okay, so now you see me. Uh, we, we prove it uh, for L1 uh, influences, which are actually the, the exactly same as the influences, just you take the derivative function instead of, uh, of take it on the L2 squared, you take the L1 norm and also the total influence. And this version of the KKL let us uh, use bounded functions. Uh, and, uh, and it's actually, it's turned out that it seems not to be true for, uh, L, for L2 uh, influences. Uh, but when we go back to the uh, Boolean functions, it's the same. So, um, so actually it's okay. But in our proof, we, we actually need the, uh, the non-Boolean version, which is uh, for uh, uh, bounded, uh, bounded functions. And this is how we, we make the chunks. We, we divide the, the, um, the function, okay? So, so you prove that there exists an influential coordinate with respect to L1 influences, and then you derive Yes, and otherwise uh, the L1 total influence is large. Yes, exactly the same, yeah. And, okay, I'll go back to my first. Uh, okay, just, just for summary. Um, I'll go back there. Okay, I hope my screen is not going to uh, dead again. Um, okay, so another thing that I, I can't use my uh, computer now, but I will talk. Uh, another thing that I want to talk about is uh, how to use these techniques for other things. Um, so for example, uh, one can try to uh, to prove another statement. Um, okay, how do I do it now? Um, one minute, sorry. The quality is. Okay. So we can use these techniques, uh, try to. Okay, <laughs> I don't have light. Okay, um, uh, you can use uh, these techniques. Uh, try to uh, to prove uh, theorems by Bungain or for your entropy influence conjecture. I want to talk about it a little. And um, actually, um, there are some proofs for other uh, uh, statements. Um, I think it's not yet published, but, uh, but they are on the way. Uh, about the, for the, the techniques that are uh, used for the Fourier entropy influence conjecture, um, once we have the log Sobolev inequality, we can try to use induction on the, both the, the influence and the entropy and to combine them uh, back together. Um, there are some ways to uh, to do inductions on Boolean functions. There are some proofs in the uh, in the field that uh, go like this, and maybe this approach will help. So what we have about the log sobel of inequality is that actually we can uh, write it the uh, an equivalent version of this is somehow look like the uh, uncertainty principle. Um, this is actually equivalent to the log sobolev that we've seen. Uh, it says that either the total influence is large 
or the entropy, the channel entropy of, of the values squared the, uh, is large. Um, and I like to uh, um, uh, to think about it um, also with the, the uncertainty principle itself, um, which says that either the entropy of the values or the entropy of the Fourier is large. And actually we have uh, in the log sobel event, the uncertainty principle, uh, same lower bound for the total influence and the Fourier entropy, which means that in some uh, cases when the ent Shannon entropy of the values is very small, uh, we actually have the, uh, the Fourier entropy influence. Um, it's already known from uh, some classes of Boolean functions, uh, but this is something very, very interesting. Um, that's what I have in a while to, to say about it. Um, so I'll go back to the questions. Maybe someone have a question. Or you want to see summary, or we we are a lack of time actually. Thank you for the great talk. I guess yeah, it's it's a good time to ask questions. Okay, someone here. Other questions in the Q and A? No. So I, I have a question about um, so. In the case when, uh, so you uh, initially were assuming that all of the support was near degree D, then you're dividing it up into the different levels. When you assumed it was near D, you were choosing random restrictions with roughly one over D. So are you doing different weight random restrictions, different values for different portions of the function and then yeah. combining them together? Yes, exactly. That's what we do. We, for every chunk, for every D, we want to take all uh, as much weight that we can drop it to the first Fourier level, analyze it, get that we have large influence there, and then combine all of them together to get large influence for F. This is exactly, yeah. Okay. So if you don't have other questions, so good night for me. It's 10, uh, it's 10 p.m. here. Thank and you. I'm in the office. <laughs> Thank you, Esti. It was really great. Thank you. Thank you. Right.